morning, everybody. So I, um, a number of us were at the, um, at a lab on Friday night about um, robotics. So I thought <clears throat> that uh, I would put together a talk a little bit about um, some of the, can you see my screen? Now? Okay. Some of the issues surrounding um, the use of robotics uh, in spine surgery. So from my understanding, you know, from my perspective, the key is really, um, Dan, can you put some of the volume up so I can hear? We've all agreed that ESLAC is that second Terminator model that's liquid metal. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, exactly. Is it T2000? I think. Yeah, that's, that's the ESLAC what, model. Yeah, the ESLAC mode. Um, <laughs> yeah. Very funny. So, when you punch him, <laughs> when you punch him, your hand just goes into the metal and he gives you that sinister look. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, in regard to the in in regard to this, I thought that the key things that uh, from some of the discussion that we were having on Friday night, the key things were really um, thinking about the accuracy of the robot, um, efficiency in terms of you know is it going to be is it going to really make you faster um, and save time, radiation exposure uh, to the to the uh, staff to the surgeon and then also um, to the patient and then cost. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we'll kind of touch on some of them. Um, so a couple papers just to, you know, start it off, um, show, you know, people really looked closely at at, uh, at these. So, so Cantelhart in 2011 uh, looked at robotic assisted pedicle screw placement for his, for, uh, for these, for their cases and showed no difference in the complication rates or the operative times. And then um, Lieber in 2019 looked at uh, 520 patients um, with lumbar uh, fusion, 257 uh, screws were placed with their robot and 257 uh, conventional screws and they showed no differences in the complication rates um, in their studies. This was a um, 2018 meta-analysis that came out that showed, uh, that looked at accuracy of pedicle screw placement comparing uh, the robot and freehand. And they looked at uh, a number of cases and overall the cases that they looked at, they showed that the pedicle screw placement uh, with the robot was uh, significantly more accurate um, than the, uh, than the free hand. Uh, wh whether those are clinically significant, um, that, that really remains to be proven, but they're looking at CT um, based uh, analysis of the screws and um, showing that, that they are in fact more accurate. Uh, this paper uh, from 2019 also was a prospective randomized control trial um, looking at uh, robotic placement versus uh, freehand or fluoroscopy assisted. And um, they used the Gertzbein Robbins classification uh, looking at um, pedicle screw ac accuracy grading. Uh, this uh, basically goes through grade A. Uh, a grade a grade A rating is basically uh, the screw is completely within the pedicle. A grade B would be there's a court there is a, it's in the pedicle but there's a cortical breach that's less than two millimeters. A grade C would be um, a breach of uh, between two and four millimeter, and then a grade D uh, would be a pedicle screw breach uh, greater than four, or, or sorry, four to six millimeters, and greater than six would be for E. Um, so they looked at this and in the robotic um, guided uh, pedicle screws they had a 95 percent. Uh, rate of accuracy uh, for grade A, and then a 86% in their fluoroscopy guided. So um, when you and then when you combine grade A and grade B, there were 98% were grade A and B for the robot and 93.5. So you had a 5% difference basically uh, between the um, robotic and um, fluoroscopy guided pedicle screw placement. Another one, another uh, meta-analysis of randomized control trials, they, they, uh, they showed a, a, a significantly fewer proximal facet joint violations uh, with the robot uh, compared to freehand, and those were uh, statistically significant findings in this, uh, this meta-analysis as well. Um, another one showing, um, uh, looking at um, robot versus fluoro, and um, this study was actually, uh, looking at uh, OR times, the duration of the surgeries were not in, uh, significantly uh, different. And um, the, both of these, uh, uh, in two of the studies in this uh, systematic review, they showed that there was less radiation exposure uh, in the robot 
um, assisted group. Um, it was less radiation, obviously, to the surgeon and to the staff, but that um, does not include um, the exposure to the patient. And so I think, obviously, one of the important things that we always need to think about is the effect of what we're doing on the patients. And even um, uh, I just put this in here. Uh, there's a British Medical Journal article in 2013 that showed one CT scan in an adolescent um, patient can increase um, can increase the risk of cancer over over the lifetime of that of that child. So that's looking at children, but we have to always be cognizant of what we're doing and and that there are, that these uh, CT scans in the especially in the younger population may not be entirely benign. Um, the cost effectiveness. So uh, the technology has been uh, claimed to be cost effective, but there's uh, not a lot of studies on that. Um, most of the studies are in terms of cost effectiveness are looking at OR time and, and revision rates. And there, there's been some papers that have reported um, revision rates that are lower with, uh, with uh, robot assisted. This one paper in the European Spine Journal in, in uh, 2011 showed that uh, they were using the Mazora and they showed reduced reoperations by 46%. I personally have no idea of how that's possible just by using a robot that maybe they were just really not that great at putting them in by a uh, freehand. I, I don't know. But but 46% seems like a very, very um, uh, interesting number to me. Uh, there was a Swedish study that um, uh, found reduced revision rates as well with the with the robotic technique. Uh, um, so Rob, yeah, if you it, it, it sounds like a big number. But remember, if you only have two patients in one group and one patient in the other, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you no, you're a, right. I guess huge, you're right. Huge reduction, right? So yeah, it's not yeah. clinically a meaningful yeah. problem, and and it may not even be statistically different. But they can say, well, it's forty percent, forty six percent reduction. That's no, you, that's where yeah, you that's get into <laughs> marketing a, ploys versus legitimate uh, statistical analysis. Yeah, very good point. <laughs> I, I was I was leery of that number, uh, but that thank you for pointing out the that uh, issue. Um, in terms of oper operating room time, I think that um, you know uh, they've looked at OR cost, uh, you know, per minute, and it, it shows in, in other studies. And I think the numbers are, are all over the map, but between eighty and one hundred dollars per minute. So you're so any anything that can reduce um, OR time can uh, potentially save uh, can potentially save uh, a lot of money. The question is, you know once you get facile with the robot, is it really, is it really saving you time? So uh, there's a couple papers out there that um, uh, Lieberman et al. showed a 36% decrease in the procedure time uh, when they looked at um, new, new robotic uh, users and a 56% reduction in, uh, in time in the OR uh, um, with, uh, with experienced users. Those were, uh, that was looking at um, cadavers uh, and measuring the time it took to put the implants in. A lot of other studies, um, uh, when they were looking at the learning curve for the robot, they reported their OR times and they did report a decreased OR time uh, with the robots. So the only issue with a lot of these studies is that I don't, I don't think they're really taking into consideration uh, the planning. So I think that you know, when you're coming into the OR with a um, a plan, uh, sorry, with a, a ready-made plan and you're just driving the screws in, it doesn't really take into account that you've, uh, you know, spent a considerable amount of time planning those out, especially for larger constructs. Um, is it, can you, I don't know, Chris doesn't have any volume anymore. Were you, were you can you change? On the audience, we can still hear your audience. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so the last thing uh, that I wanted to kind of touch on was something that uh, that the um, uh, Globus people were were kind of showing us as what what's down the what's down the pike for for them in terms of their technology. So they were showing their sort of augmented reality um, goggles, which I, I thought was really a cool concept, but you know. I'm not sure that it's going to be ready for prime time uh, anytime soon, but there's other um, companies out there that have um, kind of uh, that are inventing other similar products. And one, one of them is this company called Augmetics. 
and is de developed by the Israelis uh, who've, who've made a, a bunch of other really cool uh, technologies that have, that have become useful in spine surgery and, and other areas of orthopedics. But the major uh, benefits of something like this augmented reality um, is really that uh, you, it's the attention shift uh, issue. So like when you're putting in pedicle screws um, and, and you're using uh, uh, either it's, whether it's a robotic or whether it's um, uh, with, with navigation, you're looking away from the patient. So the idea is, you know, putting these augmented reality uh, goggles on that can allow your, your attention to be focused on the patient and not um, away at a screen uh, somewhere else uh, in the room. So this is really kind of uh, one of the key benefits of this technology. Um, this was a paper published in, uh, in Sp <clears throat> excuse me, in Spine in 2019. And they looked at um, uh, the augmented reality uh, system that, um, that Augmetics uh, created. And basically they showed that this was, uh, that, that they could achieve a fair, fairly good accuracy um, with pl uh, with placement of ped pedicle screws um, using their using their system, so I think that it has um, you know could have some um, interesting applications uh, in spine surgery in the future. But again, I think that this is the technology doesn't seem quite ready for prime time uh, just yet. But it's something that's pretty cool that um, could be uh, something that we see down the line. And then a bunch of other companies are getting in in the game. Um, Google and uh, and J and J uh, are coming together with a, a collaboration to kind of create an augmented reality system with medical applications. So these are these are huge um, amount of um, technology uh, uh, investment into this uh, into this space. So we'll see what happens. And that's all I got for that. I don't know if anybody has any comments on. I know there was a lot of discussion Friday night about. Um, so, so, Rob, my comment on, on the data is that it's not a surprise to me that there is improved accuracy when you're using imaging guidance as opposed to no imaging guidance, um, or that even that there's maybe like a slight iterative improvement when you're using a three-dimensional image guidance versus a two-dimensional image guidance. But to my knowledge, there's no comparison of using standard navigation um, freehand versus the robot. And my mm -hmm. guess is that you wouldn't, you wouldn't find a difference. I, I don't think that having that arm you know, hold you in place is, is a meaningful difference. And the sky being issues, which I think a lot of the companies are getting better at, um, probably, you know, that air equilibrates with the air of, you know, maybe you have a navigation uh, issue. But um, I've not seen any of that data. And my guess is that it would be a, it would be a wash. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I did not see any papers comparing robot to, to nav. Most of the um, most of the papers we're looking at uh, robotic compared to freehand or compared to uh, fluoroscopy guided. So I, I completely agree with you. I, I don't think just, just the logic doesn't, uh, you know, you know, make any sense. I mean, it's using the same thing. It's using navigation to place the screws. So I don't see that there would be much difference uh, if the yeah, arm is it's doing not the it. robot. It's the imaging guidance. Right. Right. What's that? Got it. I've, I've definitely seen that on joints. We have like a navigation system we use at Balboa. Yeah, we can't use a chart and use the robot and the robot just makes it uh, kind of take more time. But the, the benefit I feel like is mostly navigation, at least in that context. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was curious what everybody's thoughts were on the accuracy. I mean, the, the, during the lab, the, those screws didn't seem that accurate to me when we looked at the fluoro. <laughs> So I was a little bit leery of it, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, in the lab, you had this torso that could move, but it right. is a liability. You know, I think in a prone yeah. position, you're probably a little less apt to have that kind of thing happen. But I, we've probably all at this point seen uh, nav or robotic outcomes lead to screws through the canal or just completely misappropriated <laughs> implants. Right because there's too much trust in it. And when you're MIS, it's, it's much more difficult because you don't have that, that open visualization to get some awareness from your own experience that things are okay. So I, I think there's, there are some remaining questions. And you know, the, other, the other issue I have with robotics and NAV in general is it, it's really just aiming right now at accomplishing what I consider is the most elementary part of the job. 
and it doesn't help or facilitate all the other things that I think are important, whether that's uh, derotating, reducing, releasing. There's just nothing else that you can do except drop these screws. And to some degree in the workflow, it interferes with those other processes that, that optimize the surgical outcome and circumstances. So, so I'm, I, I, I still have great hope for it, but you know, it, it has to evolve and be more capable and, and add to our workflow efficiency in my mind. It's yeah. interesting, though, Bob. I want to interject one thing. I think, I don't know what percentage, but I would say a, a, a vast amount of the population of spine surgeons really are hyper concerned about putting that screw in. And a lot of their practices don't consider some of the other things that are, are, are foundational to what we all do. And that's the derotation, the correction and so forth. So I think that's why there's this huge, like I think surge in the market to gravitate towards these things. And I don't like that term enabling surgery. It's like people are being enabled to do things they shouldn't. I'd prefer it be called assistive surgery because we should look for things that assist us with what we do, maybe improve our workflow, decrease radiation, exposure uh, and, and increased patient safety and outcomes. But the term enabling to me, like at the root of it, just implies that people are doing something they probably shouldn't be doing. I wonder, um, Dr. Eastlake, what your thoughts were about um, sort of uh, de using the robot in decompressive uh, aspects of the surgery relative to your comment. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think there's, there's, there's great promise in that in the future, but there's there are big legal and liability hurdles that have to be overcome. I mean, the, the, the companies are very constrained right now, and and I'm I guarantee you worried about moving in that arena because it it, it exposes them to probably liability risk to a large degree when they start <clears throat> doing not. Um, when they get that close to the high risk part of the operation as um, you know, is really sort of performing it. Um, I think in the future we'll get there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't see a way around that. And, and, you know, I, I think there's still fairness to look at a, a technology like this and say, look, when deployed for all surgeons on average, it actually improves effectiveness or, mm -hmm. or accuracy. That may be true. You know, I mean, we have a real high volume. We do a lot of this stuff and maybe just on blend the, you know, the, the average surgeon out there who's not doing a ton of spine surgery, putting a lot of screws in really benefits from this. Um, and, and really their patients benefit from it because they are more accurate. I, I don't want to take away that message. I mean, that was sort of the promise of NAV and robotics. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I agree. I, 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 I'm interested to see how that goes. I mean, to me, the argument about, uh, you know, when you're, when you're using the robot to cut your, make your tibial cut on a total knee, that's pretty dangerous if the robot isn't, isn't very accurate. Um, so I think there's, they've, they've, they've overcome that hurdle in, in, in total knee arthroplasty. So I think it's, it's the same idea taking bone, uh, away and, um, well, I guess we'll see. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, yeah, listen, um, take too great, much bone great, away, great topic, but you, we need to. 